The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. OK, more about sociobiology, see what kind of subjects they study. I can tell you about uh, later this week, we will have a quiz on Wednesday. It'll be a short quiz just based on the mating behavior chapter in Scott that I talked about uh, last week and Wednesday. And then on Friday, we started sociobiology. So it'll be on the first two chapters of the sociobiology book and the things we've said in class including today. I know you have a homework due, but it's not due till Friday, and you've had quite a bit of time for it, so. All right. These are just some major issues in sociobiology and major def definitions. When sociobiologists use the term fitness, they're generally, and they talk about fitness costs and fitness benefits. You know, what do they mean? It's, it's not like survival to the fittest, you know, uh, but it's related to that. Uh, it always means, uh, it's always talking about survival of your genes. So it's defined as the number of surviving offspring, or more precisely, the number of an individual's own genes passed on to surviving offspring. Oops. So fitness costs are anything that reduces the probability of gene survival and benefits things that increase the probability of gene survival. So a little bit about how sociobiologists think about it. Think of possible fitness benefits and costs to a female bird if she engages in extra pair copulations. She's got a mate, but she flies off and mates with another male too, not necessarily deserting the first male. Uh, so what are the what are the fitness benefits and what are the costs to her? And are they the same for the male? So I want you to think about how you could get information to test those kinds of things. What would you have to look for? You know, we can make up reasons for why it could help her pass on more genes, you know, having another nest, having more laying eggs there, having more offspring, but that only works if the first ones survive. Like if the male is taking care of those eggs and wouldn't want to desert them because then his fitness would go down. It would cost him his fitness. But there are certainly costs, too. The male can change his behavior towards that female, can make it more difficult for her uh, to pass on genes. It's, you can, so what, would you, what kind of data would you have to collect? You'd have to follow these birds over a, a period of time, and it's difficult to do it precisely unless you can connect, uh, uh, collect DNA data on the younger birds. You know, and find out what exact, how many offspring does she really have? And you then would compare birds that engage in this kind of extra pair copulation and the ones that don't. That's the kind of thing sociobiologists do. Uh, so let's deal with some of the misunderstandings, and there's been a lot of them that have appeared. He, uh, Alcott quotes these three people. These are the quotes uh, that I selected from Alcock. Derek uh, 
Bickerton uh, says that when a bird practices what zoologists call extra pair copulation, can we really call this adultery? The intent of the two activities is completely different. Michael Rose said there's the fundamental problem that if most people calculate Darwinian plans of action, they certainly aren't aware of it introspectively. Net Darwinian fitness doesn't figure in the great lyric poems. And then William Kimmler, he criticizes the sociobiological claim that adulterous women have sometimes raised their genetic fitness by cuckolding a social partner on the grounds that she might be seeking more emotional satisfaction rather than simple genetic benefit. So, you can understand their statements, and there's a lot of truth in them, but is it really a criticism of sociobiology? First of all, these first two guys are confusing conscious intent with the outcome. Sociobiologists don't care about the conscious intent of the animal or the person. It only cares about the result, the outcome, and passing on genes. So, fitness is not about conscious intent. And Kimmler is a more common kind of mistake in these criticisms that you see of sociobiology. They fail to separate proximate cause from ultimate causes. They don't separate proximate motivational states. They're very distinct from the ultimate results, meaning passing on the genes. So Alcock summarizes it by saying, an understanding the difference between proximate and ultimate hypotheses, which are different but complementary to one another, can help us avoid the kind of confusion evident in Kimmler's complaint about sociobiology. Okay, so make sure you understand that. You might be asked, I might get up, make up something and say, you know, what's wrong with this criticism? You should be able to separate these two kinds of hypotheses, the two kinds of causation, I should say. So let's take a mech one specific behavior and contrast the proximate mechanisms and causes and ultimate outcomes. We did this before. Uh, let's do it for the human tendency to eat high-fat, sweet foods. So for proximate mechanisms, we want to consider psychological and physiological anatomical mechanisms, the proximate causes, and then separately, the reasons that they evolved. Those are the ultimate causes in, in uh, terms of uh, Darwinian theory and sociobiology, which uses Darwinian theory as its main uh, tool. So, for example, this human desire to eat high-fat sweet foods, ultimate causes, it evolved to increase genetic fitness. That, don't, that sort of goes without saying. Uh, genetic fitness doesn't involve long-term survival. It involves survival long enough to pass on the genes successfully. I should say it doesn't very much involve long-term survival, just you know, long-term survival. We pointed out, I think, before that, you know, even grandma and grandpa can still benefit their genetic fitness by taking care of offspring, providing funds to help their offspring, and, so, and their, help their grandchildren or children go to college, things like that. Okay. So that's a role after they're no longer reproducing. Just how important that is in evolution of humans, and certainly even more in other species, where it may be there more, more debate about that. Now, proximate causes are the kinds of things studied 
in this department. Taste effects on hunger and eating, the innate releasing mechanisms, same thing the ethologists talked about. Brain mechanisms, hormonal mechanisms, the various feeding reflexes and fixed action patterns. Those are all the proximate mechanisms we could talk about. And we could map those out for human desire to eat high fats and sweet foods. What are, what's about my question there? What are the advantages of fat and sweet foods? Can you tell me? What's so good about fat? Why do you choose it if you're going on a long cross-country hike that's going to last for several days? You need a lot of energy to do that. How much energy is there in fat compared with what there is in carbohydrate or protein, for that matter? You know, aren't candy bars just as good as sausage? Well, fat can fat candy bars with a lot of fat are the most are the most beneficial for those long hikes. Think of the way humans evolved as hunter gatherers. They need you can get a lot more energy per gram, more than twice as much from fat. Nine calories per gram, actually kilocalories. We call them calories. Nine calories per gram in fat, and only four carbohydrate and protein. Okay. Very good reason why we evolved that desire to eat high fat and sweet foods. Why sweet? Quick energy. Fat is slow to digest. You might need the energy much sooner. For that, the sweet carbohydrates digest the fastest. That's why I carry glucose pills here. Okay. Okay, let's talk about this interesting controversy that occurred in the 1960s. Wynn Edwards and George C. Williams. Williams is, is great to read. If you ever get a chance, he's written some really interesting things. When Edwards wrote this book, uh, he was British. It was published by a press in Edinburgh. Uh, 1962, Animal Dispersion in Relation to Social Behavior. It became very popular. And the views expressed there persisted and even they persist even today in public perceptions of evolution. I summarize it here. He interpreted almost every aspect of social behavior to be altruistic self-sacrifice that advances the welfare of the species. That is, what evolves well, things that are benefiting to the species. Conrad Lawrence mentions species benefit in, in his book that summarizes many years of work in ethology. Can someone tell me why that didn't hurt Conrad Lawrence? If he was wrong? Well, let's first show that he was wrong. That's what George C. Williams did in 1966, just four years later. He published a book called Adap Princeton University Press, Adaptation and Natural Selection. He presented the counter thesis that evolved adaptations, including behavioral ones, were extremely unlikely to pr promote the long-term survival of entire populations or species at the expense of individual reproduction. And you can read there on page 30 in Alcock his thought experiment. You know, you imagine, you know, a group of individuals now, and most of them limited their reproduction. This sounds a lot like current 
problems we have with population control, doesn't it? They limited their product, their reproduction for the benefit of the group as a whole. Let's say they're a small group. It's difficulty obtaining enough food, so they limit their reproduction to make it easier for the whole group. Ah, but say you had a few individuals there that said, heck with that. I want more kids. And they don't follow that practice. They're not feeling so altruistic. Sorry, where did my slide go here? Okay, and uh, what would happen? Well, the ones having more offspring, those genes are going to increase. The ones limiting their reproduction will not increase at the rate those people that violate that rule. And eventually, the genes of those people that only think about their own reproduction, those are going to become dominant. And Williams argued that pretty forcefully in this book. And from that point on, many scientists read it, it totally changed the way people were looking. at evolution by natural selection as applied to animals in general, not just humans. So what about effects like this? I mentioned that overcrowding results in population declines. We know that it does. And these declines are caused by physiological and behavioral effects of stress. Example, uh, you can find in animals that live in overcrowded conditions, overactive adrenal gland secretions, uh, decreased immune system function, increased social conflict. Those kinds of effects reduce fertility. And that makes them what we call a Darwinian puzzle of great interest to sociobiologists. Darwinian puzzles are things that don't seem to fit our view of genetic fitness. But we're neglecting one thing here, and it seems to have been neglected by, by Williams, and that is, remember, Wilson discusses the issue of group selection quite extensively, and he cites George C. Williams. He was very aware of the Williams book. He admired Williams. So he was careful to evaluate the conditions that could favor interdemic selection for genes. What's a deme? It's the population, the smallest population where people interbreed uh, fairly randomly at least in the model modeling of their behavior. So in other words, issues that favor some kind of group selection, which involves altruism in most cases. But it's a very complex issue, and the arguments about it continue to this day. In fact, sociobiologists discounted group selection so completely after about 1975 when sociobiology appeared. It was actually in the 1980s and it really took hold and studies of animal behavior were dominated by sociobiological studies. And they weren't talking about group selection at all. It's only more recently where uh, they began to... There's more people that are focusing on factors in group selection. The exception was, of course, the social insects, which... In their colonies, they function almost as a single organism. Where, of course, things that benefit the group were paramount in other, in, for reproduction of the 
of the social insect, ants and bees, and other social insects. The special topic of Wilson's uh, empirical studies. So what is, I mentioned what a Darwinian puzzle is, and this is the way it's defined. Anything that appears to reduce an individual's chances of reproducing successfully, even by a small degree, becomes by definition a Darwinian puzzle. Because it seems to go against the very thing we're saying is the driver of evolution. And uh, these are, I just took a couple of examples here. The first one, very simple. We talked about it before. Why do whirligig beetles congregate so much when large groups of them are attacked more often than smaller groups? They congregate in order to forage. And when they're, they're in these large groups, it does have a cost in reproduction of any individual. We look at it statistically. Okay. But if you measure the attacks per individual as group size increases, you find out that it goes down. In other words, you benefit by being in the group because, yes, you, the group might get attacked more if you're in a larger group than in a smaller group. But the chance of an individual being attacked actually goes down. And this outweighs the costs. Second one is, why do humans love pet dogs so much? Even though dogs can spread disease and cause lethal bites, and yet, it's a long history of humans' attachment to dogs. It could be a maladaptive side effect of proximate mechanisms that evolve for other reasons. Like, for example, caregiving responses, need for companionship. We're also very social animals. Desire for protection. Human responses to loyal friendliness. Just interpreted in terms of modern conditions, for most people, it's difficult to imagine that the costs are really less than the benefits. But in earlier times, my belief is that dogs, which have been associated, and if you look at paleontological records, and you find bones of dogs in, in the Remains of human settlements uh, a very long time ago, you know, at least 30,000 years, probably more. Some claims it goes back much further to ancestors of humans. But at least humans have kept dogs for a very long time. What would be the big advantage to those early groups of humans of having a dog? Think of the dog's senses. What the dog can sense that we can't. If you have pet dogs at home, you must know some of this. Think of their hearing. They know if there's an intruder on your property or just a stranger or even grandma come to visit. They know long before you do. And they make a noise and they let you know something's out there. And we know they're incredibly good. In olfactory, olfactory sense. So they make incredibly good companions for hunting and for protection of the whole group. And I think the, those effects would explain, even though people were getting occasionally bit by dogs and suffering lethal bites, even, it probably didn't happen very often when the dog was socialized properly from infancy. Why? Because, the, remember, 
this phenomenon of imprinting we talked about. There's something like that in dogs, and they socialize to humans, and they're not dominated. Their allegiance is not dominated by other dogs, but by humans. And that makes the chances of getting one of those be- uh, bites a lot less. You get problems when the dog, especially some species of dog, gets very attached to guarding humans. And it's usually a stranger or a child that does something with a neighbor's dog or something. Sometimes even their own. The dogs make mistakes. And sometimes the dog is so attached just to the master that the children aren't fully incorporated in the master's group. This can happen. So anyway, yes, they do cause lethal bites, but I don't think it would have been, we wouldn't have kept dogs for so very long if there weren't benefits, fitness benefits that outweigh the cost. So that's the way I would solve that Darwinian puzzle. Okay, now in the appendix of Elcock's chapter, he he raises uh, specific questions in his uh, question two. I've, I just selected two of them that seem to me to be a little less obvious than B and D. Number B is, uh, I can read it to you, 225. His questions in the appendix are quite interesting, and we'll we'll look at them every once in a while. The first one is actually, the first question is also very interesting. This is question two. Uh, Part B is, the readiness of some adult birds with offspring nearby to scream loudly when in the grasp of a predator. Why would that challenge a Darwinian adaptation? It probably wouldn't challenge him as much as C would, but some people could argue with that. Because how often is that scream of the bird going to either startle the predator? Of course, it's designed to startle the predator so the bird can get away. And then if the predator pursues the adult, Instead of going after her nest, the nest might be spared. And in fact, uh, the young birds, in some of them anyway, will have a response to that scream from the adult. And they will huddle and be quiet, and they're pretty well camouflaged. They might not even be detected. But what about A? The arduous journey of an ocean-dwelling salmon to locate and swim up a stream, it locates by olfactory sense, swims up the stream, actually the stream where it was, it came from, in order to breed. It entails very high costs, as most of you know. These salmon will swim very long distances up such streams, often having to, to leap because the streams, of course, are flowing down. And they have to go back up to get closer to the source where they want to breed. So the costs are very high and they don't all make it. So what are the benefits? What are the fitness benefits? Did we talk about that before? What's the obvious benefit it must have? Why do any animals that migrate in order to breed. Why do they go such long distances? What are the advantages? We don't have to... It would be the same. We talked about some of these birds that go very long distances to get to breeding grounds. Even over mountains, they'll go thousands of miles in some cases. Some turtles do this too. What are the benefits? Because the young are particularly susceptible to predation, you need to go to an area which is usually not the area where your food is most plentiful 
You need to go to an area where the chances of predation are the least. And in fact, for many species, they go to an area where they various members of the species congregate. So even if there is a predator, the chance that any one off any one baby animal will be attacked or reduced. So those are the fitness benefits. And then we, we talked about this before when we talked about uh, par parasitic uh, uh, nesting. Birds accept eggs from non-mates, even from another species, and take care of them. They feed the hatchlings. There seem to be no fitness benefits, at least not immediate ones, at least in Alcock's reading of it. The behavior may be a maladaptive side effect of caregiving fixed action fitness. So first of all, what does that phrase mean? What's the caregiving fixed action pattern that the parasitic bird who lays eggs in another bird's nest is taking advantage of? Do you remember? should be obvious. Response to the gape. And often these parasitic birds, like the cuckoo, you know, his gape is even bigger than most songbirds, so the parent gets a supernormal stimulus for eliciting the feeding response. So it gets fed even more than the bird's own offspring. Is it completely maladaptive? What did I say about, and this is, Changes a little bit what uh, Alcock said here. He says there appear to be no fitness benefits, but in fact there is a fitness benefit because, in the case of the cuckoo anyway, the spotted cuckoo in Spain where it's been studied, uh, the adult birds that lay their eggs in other nests hang around and they enforce that caregiving. The birds that throw their eggs out, that would be the adaptive response, the way Alcock's thinking. But in fact, the birds that do that get their nests totally disrupted and their offspring killed. So basically, yeah, they may, it, fewer of their offspring will survive, but at least some of them will survive. Okay. But this is how you go about dealing with these Darwinian puzzles. Okay. Oh, this is another... Uh, I want to know how an evolutionary biologist would respond to this argument of Marvin Harris about the origins of human welfare. He's a cultural anthropologist, and this is what he argued. He argued that human... Warfare stems from the inability of pre-industrial peoples to develop a less costly or more benign means of achieving low population densities and low rates of population growth needed to prevent over-exploitation of essential, essential resources. So what's wrong with the argument? Very simply, he's talking about species benefits. He's making the more important benefits to the individual. Benefits meeting fitness benefits. Okay. Remember, they're always using these terms about benefits and costs very specifically to refer to probability of gene survival. Okay, more about sociobiology. And let, let's just review. These are the, from last class. Uh, this is where some of these beautiful statements of E.O. Wilson. Uh, remember that the organism, in a sense, doesn't live for itself. Its primary function is to re reproduce other organisms. It reproduces genes and serves as their temporary carrier. You say, but wait a minute. You're totally opposed to religion here? No, I'm not. I'm telling you what the mechanism is, how humans evolved. And we will talk specifically about that later, because I don't agree with Alcock in this point. Okay, so he talks about the centers of this brain that is more a reproductive organ than anything else. 
the centers of the brain complex tax the conscious mind with ambivalences whenever the organisms encounter stressful situations. Love joins hate. Aggression joins fear. Expansiveness joins withdrawal and so on. And blends designed not to promote the happiness and survival of the individual, but to favor the maximum transmission of the controlling genes. And that is the view of sociobiology. That's the theme of his entire book. Okay. The most important thing in this slide is what I've underlined here. You should know what it, we will use the term deem occasionally. It's a special population, defines the smallest local set of organisms within which interbreeding occurs uh, reasonably freely. Uh, but you should be able to separate population and society because they seem to be the same, but populations bounded by a zone of sharply reduced gene flow, whereas the society is bounded by a zone of sh sharply reduced communication. Now, in many cases, those two things might coincide, but they certainly don't always coincide. They're, they're defining a different aspect of the large group of, of a certain species. Uh, the evolutionary pacemaker always means, it's always, you're talking about that when both behavior and body structure change in evolution. And when that happens, and when it, they are able to collect adequate data on it, it seems that the behavior of changes occur before changes in body structure. That means, actually, it, it's a little overstated here in because you would have to say the part of the body that changes first is the brain. And then structure adapts to what's needed for the particular behavior that's evolving. Okay. You should know the term demography because we will use it sometimes, you know, in the rest of the class an adaptive demography. Demography always means the way different ages of a species are distributed. You know, how many really young, how many young adult, how many reproducing age, how many older ones, how many very old ones. This is demography. You talk about the demographics of a society. They're very different in different countries. And that will come up again. So we're always talking about different ages or sizes. Sometimes size is the more important factor for some things. We've, we've already seen advance, uh, uh, examples of behavioral scaling, and we will see more. Uh, but you want to keep in mind this statement that evolution leads to compromises in social evolution because adaptations at one level may not be adaptations at another level. What's adaptive for the individual may not be adaptive for the family. Family groups are small enough, though, that uh, there, there might be conflicts, but they usually are resolved in such small groups, but certainly not at the higher levels. And then, of course, ultimate versus proximate causation. He discusses... Uh, he made that a major point, and it's been ever since in the field of sociobiology. Okay, so then he talks about the prime movers of social evolution, phylogenetic inertia. These are the factors that slow evolutionary changes in social behavior. Reduce genetic variation, well, re slow evolutionary change. And that can happen in periods of very reduced population size, for example. With less genetic variation in a very small population, it will slow evolutionary change. And uh, the term genetic swamping means that if populations are usually divided into smaller groups, of course, 
And often one subgroup begins to change because of altered environmental conditions. But if they all aren't subject to the same environmental conditions, some live further north, some live further south, some live in where, where a, there's a new predator, some do not. It only takes occasional interbreeding with another subgroup to prevent the less adaptive genes from disappearing. Okay, that's genetic swamping. When food food sources change, uh, a group may not change its habits because of genetic swamping for the same kind of reason. Food in some regions can change. Okay. So that's another one. That's all factors that can slow evolutionary changes. We talk a lot about the various ecological pressures, conditions that result in evolution of specific patterns of social behavior. He gives examples from anti-predator behavior and other examples from foraging. Uh, I like the, his quote, when spider webs unite, they can halt a lion. <laughs> Colonies are a lot harder for predators to approach undetected. And, and attacks have reduced the probability of harming any individual when they're in a large group. We've talked about that. He points out that even though organized colonies are the most effective, even an unorganized colony, an unorganized herd instinct will evolve in animal groups and still be effective. And some cattle groups, groups of fish or squid or flocks of birds are not that well organized, and yet they still have benefits of forming those groups. Locust swarms is another one. Another example of this uh, uh, evolution of social behavior for, because of ecological pressures related to predation is synchronized breeding. We just mentioned that. Birds that reproduce in colonies, they might not live that way all the time, but for reproduction they might live that way. The social ungulates uh, synchronize their breeding. Uh, what's the name of the ungulate in Africa, the one that migrates long distances in the Serengeti? They all breed at the same time. So the big cats that chase them uh, are less likely to get, they won't get all of them. The, the chances of an individual being caught are a lot less if they all are breeding at the same time. And then we've already talked about group defense strategies. Uh, we didn't talk about the owl fly larvae. They, when confronted by insect predators, they gang together to, because their individuals are less likely to be attacked. Uh, you have that in bee colonies. You have the meerkats that have their lookout. There's sort of a guard meerkat. You have it in musk oxen that form this circle around their young. And musk oxen are pretty big, and they're a pretty good defense against wolves. So if they're organized, they do it as a group. They're much more effective keeping the wolves from getting at their young. And the wolves are a lot less likely to be able to bring down an adult musk oxen. And then we've already talked about mobbing by birds, and it occurs in primates as well. And here's examples related to foraging, where social behavior has adapted to conditions of foraging. Uh, 
groups and cliques can increase competitive ability and feeding. They help each other in the smaller group to compete against other groups. That's certainly a social adaptation. Uh, groups, coalitions, and cliques. Then increase feeding efficiency by social behavior. He talks about, he uses the term imitative foraging. Uh, we know that birds form territories when food is evenly distributed, but you'll still see imitative foraging in these birds. When one bird starts eating in a particular place, other birds will just follow it. And uh, in cooperative forag foraging, uh, this is when you get birds flocking in order to uh, more easily find food. And when it is fine, you're more likely to see it because there's so many eyes looking for it. And then they'll all get some, or at least most of them will. Uh, so it's a great benefit in foraging. The same, similar things for pack hunting animals and the cooperation of ants, uh, honeybee communication, which we've talked about. And large prey, of course, is a factor that encourages um, group hunting in the car large carnivores. And But I point out there at the end that chronic food shortages, like faced by the moose here in the northern part of New England uh, and Can the adjacent parts of Canada where there's a lot of moose. Uh, it makes solitary antisocial behavior a lot more likely. Okay, so I want to talk a little bit. We'll, this will be the last thing. I think there's, well, a little bit more we'll talk about next time. Calculation of the inbreeding coefficient. It's also called the coefficient of kinship. We've talked about the importance of genetic relatedness in breeding and in behavior. We, our own fitness can benefit by helping, I'm not talking about humans necessarily, but any animal will benefit if he helps animals that are close related. So let's just look at uh, Wilson's discussion. He calculates here the genetic relatedness of the offspring of the mating of two half-siblings. Here's the two siblings, male and the female. They have the same mother, okay, different father. So what you have to, this is the way you calculate that. Here's the individual. We We know that here, the probability that A and B are the same for any one allele is one half. We know that the, chance, the probability of A and A prime being the same is one half. We know that the probability of A prime and B prime being the same is one half. Okay, so now we want to calculate the probability that B and B prime are identical. That's the coefficient of kinship. Okay. How related are you? Basically, how many genes, what's the proportion of genes you're likely to share with the individual? And see how that's important in calculating uh, inbreeding. Okay, so to get that, you simply multiply the one-half by one-half, one-half. You get one-eighth. So one-eighth Basically, one eighth of the genes, the probability that any one of them, one, one allele is identical, is going to be one eighth. Okay. So now, you, here's what I want you to pay attention to. If we count steps backward from one parent to a common ancestor and back to the second parent, we get three here. Okay. One, two, three. Okay. So if we compute one half to the third power, we get that number, the inbreeding coefficient. This makes the assumption that A here is not inbred. 
That's called path analysis. Every possible path leading to every common ancestor is traced separately. It's the same as the probabilities obtained from every separate path. Let's just take one more example, the full sib mating. Here are the parents. Here's two of their offspring. They both have the same two parents. Okay. They then mate and have this individual offspring. So you follow the paths. This path, C, A, D. Three steps. If you want A. And then C, B, D. The other path to the other common ancestor, you get an eighth. Okay? You have to add those. So the probability in a full sib mating of getting the shared, the allele being the same at any one point is one fourth, which also means approximately 25% of their genes will be, have identical alleles. Okay? And then you can calculate for a first cousin or a more complex pedigree. It always works, and I will post this file online. Okay, that's path analysis. Very important in the kind of gene calculations done by sociobiologists.